Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Anyway, I thought it'd be useful, just fun, to do a little rap session to talk about my development, that what you've been doing with me since I started working with you, because I didn't get to a 605 deadlift overnight, right? This took yeah. four years. And during that time, we changed a lot of things sure. as you got to know me as an athlete and as I advanced as a lifter. And so some other questions I get frequently besides like, why are your feet so close together is like, did you do that using three by five? Right. What's your nutrition look like? What does your programming look like? So I thought maybe, I know we can't get too detailed, sure. but sort of give people a broad overview of like, what did I do when I started working with you? Yep. And then what was the philosophy in changing my programming as I got more and more advanced? And then we can also talk about nutrition too. And, and Yeah, I actually think they're tied together. Yeah. So And so it's essentially two workouts, three times a week. So a workout A and a workout B. Right. Workout A is squat three sets of five, Press three sets of five, deadlift one set of five. That's work sets. And that's the same weight across for those, right? Uh, workout two is squat three sets of five, but a little heavier than you did the day before, two days before. Bench press instead of press, three sets of five, deadlift one set of five. And then you just keep alternating workout A, workout B, workout A, workout B, alternate those every single week for as long as you can, adding about five pounds per lift right. for as long as you can. Yep. And that's exactly what you did. And eventually you can't do that. Or if you did, you would squat 1,000 and deadlift 1,200. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. It gets you super motivated for training. Because like, I remember when I first started working with you, man, the next workout, the night before, I'd be super excited. because like, I get to go up five pounds. That's right. It's a PR every, every, every day. Single every single workout, workout right. is a PR. So that's like super, super motivating. So that helped really help establish the habit that's right. of training for me. That's right. So then, uh, as that starts to slow down, and usually squatting heavy three times a week becomes difficult. Yeah. So we often move to like a Wednesday or middle workout light day. So you still, same sort of programming, but instead of going up on Wednesday, you would go to like an 80% of what you were doing for three sets of five. And we ran that for a little while, so that stopped working. And then we moved to a four-day split, right? And so we- So what's a four-day split? So what a four-day split is two upper body days and two lower body days. And you're doing three full body days Right, you're squatting every workout. Every workout, you're benching or pressing every workout, and you're deadlifting every workout. And so what you do when you move from a three-day split to a four-day split is you take really the same total amount of work and you just divide it up over four days. So now you're going to squat and deadlift twice a week, and you're going to bench and press twice a week. And so we did that. And then at the point that that stops working, you start doing things like manipulating one variable or one small change at a time, what we call the minimum effective dose change. So we look at your programming and we say, if the programming has been working and it now plateaus, in traditional programming theory, what you do is you just stop doing that program and start a new program. And the new program looks nothing like the old program. But we never really did that with you. We took your program, we said, this has worked really well. It started to plateau. What's the smallest change we can make to maximize the return on investment? And what that did was that gave us good data about the change. I would be lying if I said that every change we made worked perfectly. Right. It didn't. No, it didn't, yeah. But if it didn't, we knew what didn't work. And if it did, we knew it worked. And so we might start to reduce your volume, especially, say, on your, your second lower body workout of the week, and increase your intensity. So you might go from three sets of five to two sets of five to one set of five to two sets of three to whatever, things like that, back off sets. But making sure that the weight continued to go up on the bar. And on the other day we might actually reduce the intensity a little bit or the how heavy the weight was, but increase the volume from three sets of five to eventually four sets of five to eventually five sets of five. So now we're doing sort of a heavy volume day and a heavy day that's low volume. And when we couldn't make progress every single week and hit PRs every week, by the way, PRs are the guiding metric that we use in programming, right? That's all really that matters. And I don't mean like a one rep max all the time. You have all these PRs in your book. Like you keep your three by five max, right. your five rep max. Five rep max, yeah. That's the big one for me. One or five. Or yeah, or ones. three rep max. Or, yeah, three reps. Like. And I've got clients that keep, uh, you know, this is my squat max in knee sleeves, not in knee sleeves, in a belt, belt hole four versus belt hole five. And that's fine because what we're doing is we're chasing PRs all the time. When you get to the point where you can't consistently make PRs every week because the amount of work and the weight that you're doing gets so much and so heavy then we have to allow for some periods of a little more recovery and we start to make progress once every two weeks and then once every three weeks and once every four weeks. And we get to that spot, we started to bring in some supplemental exercises like the deficit deadlift, rack pulls, box squats, tempo squats, 
squats with chains and deadlift with chains. We put chains on the bar. And what that does is it makes the weight lighter at the bottom. And as chains hang off the bar, they get heavier and heavier and heavier as you get to the top. It works that strength curve, that kind of natural strength curve that we all have. So what those allow you, the supplemental lifts allow you to do is it allows you to do the movement of the main lift, but it's not so hard on your body. I mean, Correct. they are hard, Yep. but like not as hard. Yeah, so what it really does is it's a partial movement with heavier weight, like a rack pull, like where you're doing a partial deadlift and you can usually do more weight yeah. or it increases the range of motion. So that sort of gives you more time under tension or more hypertrophy or more theoretical volume, but the weight is gonna have to come down a little bit. So you, if you were standing on two inches of, of mats and you were deadlifting, you would deadlift a little less than you would deadlift without the mats, right? And so we do that for all the lifts. We do it for the squat. We'd have supplemental lifts for the bench press. We talk about that on the Barbell Logic channel a lot. We go through a lot of those how-tos for how to do that. The key on supplemental lifts and, and for you, especially we did, is our supplemental lifts were very, very close to the main lift. So the further away you get from the main lift, a Bulgarian split squat, one foot, single leg, on a BOSU ball squat, doesn't really make your squat right, go up. Right. But a squat that you just perform a little slower, like a slow tempo descent and a fast ascent will carry over pretty well. A pause squat will carry over pretty well, a box squat will carry over pretty well, chain squats. Those are all very similar to the main movement. So that's what we did. How long was I into my training with you? This So I did the three by five for like three or four. I mean, how long? I can't even remember. Three or four months. And yeah. by that point, we still weren't doing a lot of supplemental stuff. No, none. Actually, right. I typically do none. We were it. doing accessories, which are different. So that's that's right. like bicep curls, barbell yeah. curls, pull Chins, up, chin dips. Ups, that's right. exactly right. Did some body weight stuff. Chins, dips or lat pull downs if you can't do chins, things like that. And uh, what's the purpose of the, that? It's just for additional slots, for additional fatigue or stress that doesn't stress you to the point of overstressing the body, right? So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to build some hypertrophy there as well. And so hypertrophy is really based on sort of muscle fatigue and the amount of time under tension. That hypertrophy occurs as the muscle fibers fatigue over time. And so we'd fatigue them as much as we could from the barbell lifts, and then we'd sort of further fatigue them with a, a little more work with the accessory movements. But yeah, very little supplemental. And then lifts. the supplemental lifts probably didn't come in, what do you think, year, uh, yeah, year probably, and a half? Yeah, probably between a year and year and a half in. And, and it starts very close. Think about a bench press. The first supplemental lift we're gonna do with a bench press is a close grip bench press. Right. So we literally take your bench press from here to here. Yeah. And that's the supplemental. And what lift. is that? I mean, what has that changed the lift? So what that's going to do is that's going to close the elbow angle a little bit more, give you a little bit more tricep work, and then also elongate the range of motion, right? So if I'm here, now I've got to go a bigger range of motion on the, so it's going to take a little, it's going to take the pecs out of the movement a little bit. It's going to put a little bit more on the front delts and a lot more on the triceps, which for you, because you struggle with the lockout, so you right. could bench press to here. And so that's the other piece of the supplemental lift. We look at the weak point of the lifter. And for you, it was the lockout of the bench press. You could yeah. throw any weight off your chest, six, eight inches off the chest, and then it would stall. And so I want to work that so that that weak point becomes strong. So the old adage of you're only as strong as your weakest link, and it's very trite to say, but it's very much true when it comes to strength training, for sure. So that's what we did. We just kept making these programming changes. Eventually, you got into advanced programming, block training, which is really still a four-day split. And then you get to the point where you can no longer make progress on just a traditional four-day split and we have to start adding volume. And when we do that, we typically add volume by adding frequency. And so we would add a fifth, either bench press or press. So now you're bench pressing three times a week and pressing two times a week. And we would add a third squat back to the mix. It'd be a lighter squat, a less stressful squat. And eventually we added a third deadlift into the mix. And that's called daily undulating periodization. And that's really probably the most advanced style of programming you can do. And by the way, this is key. You don't want to do that if you're a beginner for a couple of reasons. Right. One, so I think a lot of people is here. They're like, oh, oh Brett, Brett did this right. deadlift 605, so I need to do that. That's right. Probably not. Which not only do. probably not. Definitely uh, not. Yeah, and for more reasons than you think. Most people look at an advanced program and they think, that looks fun. Is it fun? No, it's, it, sucks. it sucks. So the guy that makes the progress the longest on the most simple programming, that's what you want to do. Like, right. Why would you do complicated if simple works, so let's start simple, let's stay simple, let's add a step, literally just one step, let's see if that variable change worked. If it did, we know it worked. If it didn't, we know it didn't, and we change the variable, and we just keep making intricate, small, tiny little titrating minimum effective dose steps, and that's what we've done for the past four years. In your training. Right, that's another important point to point out is that you don't need to do this sort of advanced stuff 
if you just want to be generally strong. That's right. Because I think a lot of people think, well, I, I, if I, you know, if I do three by five, then I just, I got to move on to this block training. But That's not right. necessarily. Maybe yeah. you do three by five sort of as a maintenance. Yeah, and you could just maintain. Because, you, and then you do like, you know, mud runs. Yeah, you do whatever, fine. Whatever you want. That's fine. Like, you, but you have to make that choice. That's right. And I remember having that conversation with you. Remember having right. that where. Yeah, it's like, what do you want to do? Yeah, I said, you are strong enough at this point. This is probably two, three years, two and a half years. Yeah, ago, it's been right. a while. I said, you are strong enough for anything that life would throw at you at this point. Right. There's nothing that life is going to throw at you where you are not strong enough. Do you want to go do mud runs with your wife? Do you want to just get in better shape? Do you want to do lots of cardio? And you said, nah, I just want to keep getting stronger. Yeah. I said, okay, well, if we keep getting stronger, then we're going to move to more competitive things. If we do competitive, it's actually not as safe. And It's not, yeah. Right? So I, I've had some, I've had been battling, in, that's another component too. Once you decide to go down that route, that's right. you're going to have to battle injuries. You have just to. Just aches and pains. Sure, but I've, I've dealt with that. Now, the question is, is it worth, is the increased strength worth the aches and pains for you? Yes, yeah, for me, because I just enjoy it. Yeah, me too. You lift with absolutely perfect form. So you don't hurt yourself because of bad form. Sometimes you just hurt yourself because of overuse, right? You right. just get some tendonitis and you've never had a major injury, right? No. So remember the worst injury you've ever had was you tore your hamstring. Yeah. No, sprinting. Well, sprinting, yeah. which was not programmed by me. Right, yeah, I just did that for fun. Yeah, that's right. You were just like, I'm just going to go see if I can beat my sprints from yeah. when I was in high school. So I had like, I think it was like hamstring tendonitis. That's right. And like, it was like a year and a half. That's right. That it finally. It and so we, we had to rehab right that. But you know, you've had some adductor tendonitis and yeah. some elbow stuff and some shoulders, but in general, nothing major. And you're really strong and you've put on 40 pounds of body weight and you've lost two inches in your waist and you know you're up about 40 percent in strength right somewhere in that ballpark Something like that, yeah so it's been a blast and we've done that all with small incremental changes along the way you are probably the most consistent client i've ever had in online coaching and that's the difference man like you just don't miss it's really really rare that you miss and you know, people that watch your channel, they know what a busy guy you are and you're doing business and you travel and you've got family and they're a big part of your life, but you make time for training and you get it done. And that means you've got a lot of blue collar days right. where you got to just punch that time right. card and get in and get out. And but here's that, I'm consistent because I enjoy it. Yeah. Like, it's, I, it's not because like I'm super, I mean, there's well, days where sure. I'm just like, oh man, I'm tired. But yeah. even those days I'm like, I'm just, I gotta go train. Yeah, so yeah. I'm gonna go crazy. Even like when I, like, I have a low grade fever, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I gotta go train. Yeah, it's, we, we were talking about that earlier, that idea of motivation over discipline. Like, that discipline's easy when you're already motivated to do the thing. Right, right, right. right? If you love training, then yeah. it's great. Now, that doesn't mean that for most of us, there are times that you've got to do white-knuckle discipline things for a short period of time. Right. But that white-knuckle discipline isn't very sustainable. And so for you, because you've just really enjoyed training. And there's times when I've had to change your programming a little bit where you're chasing numbers and chasing numbers and chasing numbers, and you got to the point where it wasn't super enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, that happens. And so we you would make tweaks out. to make it more enjoyable. Like, yeah. okay, well, let's just have some fun in the gym and kind of maintain right now. And really, you know, we approach diet the same way. You've done the same yeah, thing with diet. I think nutrition is another important aspect of this because that goes hand in hand with the training. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's, there's been a lot of change there. So like when I started working with you, I was doing like low carb, yep. higher fat, you know, high yep. protein. And we kept with that. You didn't make any changes sure. with that, with my diet. Right. So let's just keep doing that. Let's see how it works. See how it works. But then there was a, reached a point where like I, I was bonking out yeah. during the middle of the session. Yep. And so we started making changes with my diet. That's right. One step at a time. And so we started increasing your carbohydrates and reducing your fat. Now, right. protein always stays high. If you're right. a strength athlete, you're going to eat a lot of protein and you do. And it's worked really pretty well. And so, of course, we make careful choices with your carbohydrates. You try not to eat processed carbohydrates very much. You eat a lot of single ingredient carbohydrates right. that don't affect your blood sugar in a negative sort of way. And But it's the same sort of that minimum effective dose change with nutrition works well, too, because if we had said from the very beginning, Brett, here's the perfect diet for you, right? You got to eat this much protein. You got to eat this much carbs, this much fat track it to a T, this much fiber, you're going to do cardio, you're going to take fat burners, you're going to do all these sorts of things. It's just not sustainable. It's not sustainable long-term. And if you're a type A driven, neurotic sort of person, and you can do it, what will happen when you make all those changes, you change everything about your diet and you get rid of all the bad habits and you replace them only with good habits all at once, is it'll work really, really well for two, three, maybe even four months, which is great. And then you're going to stop right. making progress. And do? then what are you going to do? Because you don't have any more cards to play. And so in nutrition, just like in programming, I kind of always want to hold some cards back in my hand so that when things plateau, I can take that and play that card. And so we did that with you. And so 
the nice thing about your nutrition is that you knew you were in this for the long haul. You didn't have to. So, you know, you heard even from some of your fans a few years ago, we put some body weight. Yeah. You got a little fatter. So, yeah, I got like, so I think we did, a, I did a YouTube video explaining like what happened to Art of Manliness videos. Right. And everyone said, you got so fat. And right. I, I did. I was chunky. Yeah. But it was part of the plan, part right? Of the process. That's right. Well, I never had you drink a gallon of milk a day. Never, right? never did but that. No. Wasn't for you. And then you put on the muscle, got really strong, and then it was really pretty simple to pull off the fat. You started pulling the fat off. It was a, just a slow to moderate process, one day at a time. And I remember going to eat lunch with you at Tulsa one day, and you walked in, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, your, your waist had gone down four inches or so at that point, and now your shoulders were wide, and I was you just you had that V taper." And you looked like a professional athlete, and I hadn't seen that. And you know, you went from skinny to sort of muscular and pudgy, right? And then we pulled off the pudge, and now you're just muscular and lean. And it made a yeah. huge difference, but it's that long term thing. Yeah. So that pudge point, like I don't remember how many calories I was eating, but yeah, my waist got up to 39 inches yep. from like I think I was like 35, 36 mm -hmm. inches. Mm -hmm. Weight got up to 220, 225, yep. which is the heaviest I ever been. But then, yeah, like muscle, like the progress in the gym was going up, but there reached a point where I just didn't feel good. Sure. Like, I just like, you know, you, you got that weird feeling. You're always pulling your t-shirt off your belly and, yep. you know, just getting winded. So we're like, we need a time to pull back, time to pull back. So we reduced the calories, took a break from, you know, driving yep. the weight up. Tried to maintain strength. Tried to maintain strength, lost the weight. Yep. And, uh, so and it wasn't even that much weight that you had to lose, right? You no. ended up losing about 10 pounds. 10 pounds. Yeah, I've been hanging but around about like 215, 210. But at that point, it was 10 pounds and five inches in your waist, right? Because you went right. from like 39 to back to 34. 34. Sometimes 33. If I, so yeah, then like I did a cut last year. I got down to 33 and a half. Yeah. But then my gain started going down. Sure. I felt like crap. Sure. And I was like, I just, I don't, I, I, feel, I feel good at 34 inches. That's right. Sure. So, but so yeah, I think that the takeaway from this is that there's not one thing that you you can do forever that's right. going to allow you to keep making changes, right? Or going, right. making progress. Making progress. So you're going to have to adapt and make some changes. But the way to do that, that is to make one change at a time. Right. Because you've found a style to train that you enjoy, then it's easy to stick with it and it's sustainable. Yeah. If you don't, if you hate lifting weights in the gym, if you hate getting stronger, like you can't stand it. Right. It's just not sustainable long term. I mean, look, I'm never going to run marathons. That's not what I want to do. But you have viewers that are watching. There's marathon runners. And they love it. And it's and amazing. And I'm, I'm super impressed by stuff. guys who can do that. That's right. Know? And so if you enjoy that, find the thing you enjoy. If the thing you enjoy is running on a purple treadmill and reading Cosmo magazine, that's not really training, right? That's exercise. Now, if you're, you know, one of our moms or, a, or just somebody that's been sedentary your whole life, start and do anything. You know, yeah. I'm not making fun of the person that's doing the best they can on January 1st. But ultimately, you have to train for a goal. And so you've got to set a goal and pursue that. And for you, it's strength. And for some people, it might be a half marathon or a 5K or a marathon or whatever those things are. Mud biking. Run, biking, whatever, right. Yeah. So, and, we, and we like doing that. We like biking. You and I like rucking. We, right. We'll yeah, rock we'll that. Like, those are fun and do that with our families and stuff. So uh, find the thing that you enjoy, but that you can work towards a goal. And if you're working towards a goal, that changes it from exercise to training. It makes it sustainable. And then do the same thing with your nutrition. Just find the one thing you can change. It's going to make the smallest impact on your life, yeah. but the biggest impact on your goal, on your return on investment, and do that. And then just track it for seven days. And if you did it perfectly for seven days, then add another habit change. And if you didn't, stick with the same habit change until you can get it. And if you find that the habit change that you're trying to make is something that you hate, right? then change the habit. Right. You you're got, you're not talking to Yeah, for me with the nutrition, it was um, if it fits your macros. Yeah. Was it the game? Because like, I want to be able to eat with my friends and my family. Right. If we have, you know, if I go to a friend's house and they have spaghetti, right. it's like, well, I want to be able to eat some spaghetti, not be the weirdo. Sorry, guys, I got to eat the chicken. But right. maybe there's some people who are like that, and that's fine. Yeah, and fine. all your friends are keto, paleo, carnivore heads. Great. That doesn't fit my lifestyle. Sure. Do what fits your lifestyle, fits your personality. That's key, right? Yeah. And so it, it works really well. It's worked well for you. And the clients of ours that have figured that out have found the thing that they really enjoy. They're the ones that make the most progress because they're the most consistent. And right. consistency is key. And it's not about discipline. It's about motivation. And, and certainly there are days that you still have to get out there and do it. No, but enjoy so, it. the discipline stuff for me is like the like the conditioning. Like, yeah, sure. I don't enjoy conditioning or Metcons. No. But I have to do it because I know it's good for my you know cardiovascular health, sure. me metabolism, bl right. blood glucose. So I, I got to use discipline on that. But like 
the other stuff I just do because I like. Well, and even with the cardio, we try to pick the things that you kind of enjoy or that you right. hate the yeah. least. Right, exactly. And so, you know, you're like, man, I really don't want to get on an exercise bike and do an exercise bike for miles and miles. I can't stand it. So we, you know, we'll use circuit training and body weight stuff and, you know, do your accessories and circuit and get your heart rate up. And we can do things like that. And it works really well. And by the way, part of this is because I've been able to coach you so long, I've really been able to figure out what you enjoy and what works for you. Right. So if you're a coach hopper, hop from coach to coach. Or uh, program hopper. Yeah, or, or, right, or program hopper. That's whatever, right. right. Which, you know, and that's, that's a big, certainly for us, it's a big point of contention because we try to actually coach people. Like I've watched every heavy set that you've done for the past four years. Right. Every heavy set. You right. video them. I break them down. We've trained together some. Just getting programming is not the same thing. And your coach can never truly learn about you and who you are if all they're doing is giving you a template or a program. And so for us, we've developed a relationship over the years where I know exactly how you like to train, I know how you like to eat, I know what's gonna make you struggle. And so, and that's not because I'm great, it's just because it takes that long a time to really fine tune your programming and your diet to get it to the point that we we need it. And so- You're also kind of like a psychologist sometimes. Oh, for sure. Right, because you're just like, oh, I just, there's like a head game that goes on with training sometimes. And sometimes you need some guy to just tell you, no, you can do it, you're fine. Yeah, there's a finding the balance or there's this dichotomy between, do I need to chew this person's rear end and right. like motivate them like a drill sergeant? Right. Like, do they need a butt chewing? Right, come um, to Jesus moment. Yeah, that's exactly right. Or do I need to encourage them? And just say, it's going to be okay. You did fine. It was it's just a rough day. You didn't sleep last night, whatever. And so- I'm super hard on myself. You, so are. you typically just encourage. I mostly encourage. Yeah. Yep. I, I'll tell you, like, I'll even make comments on my video. Like, this this set sucked. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. You're also very in tune with, and you give me good feedback on how your food was the day before. Right. How sleep, your stress is. Stress how much work stress, sleep, all those sorts of things. And so that's, you know, and it's funny, like, over the years, like, we started with a complete- client coach relationship and we're really good friends now we hang yeah, out all the right. time and yeah. and i think part of that is you, there are a few people on earth that i interact with and you interact with probably more than we interact with each other right because you're training four times a week and yeah. so we talk almost every day yeah. and you know when i have business issues i call you up and use you as a mentor and vice versa and so it's a it's been a good relationship and that's the way a healthy coach client relationship should look yeah well that's another point too like you can do this stuff on your own you can it is possible. Of course. Um, but if you're, I mean, one thing that's really, I think, a game changer was getting a coach. Yeah. That's like, I don't want to be like too salesy here. Sure. Because again, you can do this stuff on you your can. own, but it's nice to be able to offload all that thinking about your programming and your training to someone else and just say, here's what you're going to do today. That's right. And I don't have to think about that. That's right. That's yeah, another and, nice component. Yeah. And the nice thing is for people who don't have a good coach in their town, in their area, you now have access to a fantastic coach online. And so, you know, we've got a lot of people that live in rural America. They don't have access to a coach in their town. American military guys, British military guys stationed overseas, or just maybe you do have a good coach in your town. You just can't get your schedules to match right, up. Right. And so you can train in the convenience of your own home or your own gym at the time that you want. And uh, that's a big part of it. And so it's been a blast. It's actually been one of the great joys of my life. And then, and then doing content for the Barbell Logic YouTube channel and the podcast has been phenomenal. You know, it's just been great for us. We have a similar business plan as you do. And that I just want to produce content for free. I just want to give the right. content away. And a lot of that is just because I, so much was given to me that I want to be able to give that back out to people. I don't need people to pay me for the content. And so the service stuff, online coaching pays for the pays the bills, but we're going to keep driving content for free. We're not going to charge you for the content. And so you can find all sorts of stuff about us there with Barbell Logic. And, and we sort of try to walk people through in a systematic progression from the very beginning of where they start through these minimum effective dose changes in programming and training and safety and form and nutrition and conditioning. All those things start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. And we work our way through. Cool. Well, Matt, Thanks for doing this little rap session. This is yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, man. And thanks for being in my uh, guest room. This is pretty nice. <laughs> Firm handshake. Thanks, man. We'll do it. Look each other in the eye. Got it. All right. It's the way you're supposed to do it. That's right. Mm -hmm.